Icons 8 Music. Welcome to today's episode of Simportant Conversations. We are going to be talking about nursing student anxiety in simulation. Uh, your MCs today are myself, Allison Stromer, and we've got Nicole Albert as well. We are both simulationists in the College of Nursing at the Rapid City site for South Dakota State University. Um, our special guests with us here today are Dr. Joe Voss and lecturer Annette Ray. Um, and I'm going to allow you guys to introduce yourselves. Uh, Dr. Voss, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right, thank you for that introduction. Um, I have been with the College of Nursing in Rapid City for the past 27 years, and I teach both undergrad and grad courses. I am extremely interested in student well-being and then also methods to decrease anxiety. Um, I've been certified and licensed by the Institute of Heart Math as a heart math coach and mentor and a trainer for the past 11 years. And the heart math skills are evidence-based skills that can be used to decrease uh, stress. All right. Thank you. Welcome to our podcast today. Yes. Um, welcome, Dr. Voss. Uh, lecturer Annette Ray, would you like to introduce yourself and experiences, please? Well, like they said, my name is Annette Ray. I have been a um, faculty with South Dakota State University uh, since August of 2017. And however, I've been involved in nursing education for the past 20 years. Um, in simulation, I have been actively involved in simulation and started a simulation program at another university um, starting in, in 2006. Um, simulation is a passion of mine because it really brings out that clinical judgment for our students and helps to prepare them um, for those clinical experiences, helps um, manage uh, patient safety or look at that uh, quality improvement, uh, all, all parts that are really important. But I have also noticed uh, anxiety and how that can play a role in their performance and in their learning. And so it's always been um, an interest of mine that I've done some independent research and, and um, reading on. So I'm really excited to be here today. All right. Well, thank you both so much for being here today. And I think, Annette, your comment about student anxiety really leads us into our topic for the day. And um, I'd like to start us out with if if you each could share or talk about some of your experiences with student anxiety, what are some anecdotal things that students have shared with you? Maybe it's a classroom setting, maybe it's a simulation setting. What are some things that you have heard um, students say or maybe seen students do that is a is manifestation of anxiety? I'm particularly interested in helping students who have test anxiety, because certainly as instructors, we want to test not level of knowledge, comprehension, and abilities to apply the information uh, related to nursing. And I certainly, and all of us don't want to test on how anxious students are, because sometimes that's what ends up being the, the result of a score is it, it shows more how anxious students are than, than anything else. And, you know, I've done some uh, work as a standardized patient also in simulation, and I can just see the anxiety dripping off of students during simulation where this is a safe environment, but yet it, it can be really anxiety producing for sure. And when I meet with students to help them with uh, um, with reducing stress and anxiety, no matter where it is. Students tell me, first of all, that, that their scores aren't showing how much they've studied and what they know. That's one thing. But also these symptoms of anxiety, students, I say they feel restless and all wound up and they're just easily fatigued. It's difficult to study and difficult to concentrate. And some even say that they're, that they're irritable. They complain of, you know, aches and pains like headaches and stomach aches and have a really hard time controlling how much worry that they have. And then I think this carries over into their sleep too. They have difficulty either falling asleep or staying asleep. And some then will, will sleep just way too much in, in order to deal with stressors. So um, that, that's kind of what, what I have, have um, seen with 
with nursing students. And I think that's interesting, Dr. Voss. Have you seen that then it can kind of create a cycle for students? Like, you know, they've got that anxiety. And so then the performance goes down and then there's more anxiety and the performance continues to sort of de-escalate. Have you seen some of that? You know, absolutely. And I think if um, a student doesn't do well on maybe a first exam in a course, then the stress and anxiety just builds because they certainly feel they need to do, uh, you know, get 100% on the next exam or near to that, or at least an A on the next exam. And it just, it, it compounds over time, that stress and anxiety. And certainly anxiety and depression go together many times and and you can see what kind of you know they're anxious but also that depression may certainly follow these um episodes of anxiety too because of decreased performance and it sounds like yeah that it just has a snowball effect um with their performance and affects all aspects of their schooling and in their life too I've noticed some similar things that Joe is talking about in the classroom uh, and in simulation. Generally, the students that are, are struggling with anxiety in the classroom with exams, for example, when they get into simulation, often are um, struggle with being on stage, a little bit of stage fright. They're concerned about embarrassing themselves because they don't want to be wrong. So there's a um, in In my experience in visiting with students, uh, sometimes I think that there's an issue with perfectionism. Also, that they they feel that everything has to be perfectly done or they failed. So, you know, again, failure with the exam, failure with performing inappropriately, again, being embarrassed. So, again, do they get restless? They're irritable. Oh, I'm too nauseous to even go in there or this is scaring me to death losing that. And even in the actual sim, even after you've talked to them and they're, you know, work through some breathing, those relaxation type things. And they go in and they say, yeah, I can go in. I I'm ready. Uh, and you can, I've watched them freeze where they, they can't even think and thank God they have a partner with them that, you know, helps them move through that experience. But I'm um, having to physically remove students from the scenario or stop the scenario to help them because they're in emotional distress for uh, students that have experienced some severe anxiety. That brings up an uh, interesting point about the freezing and you know not being able to think anymore. Paul Thope and Wilson actually had discussed an inverted U curve representing learning and challenges, and they kind of did the U in three zones. So the comfort zone, student's comfort zone or learning zone, it's not really challenging, um, you know, not really exposed to challenges, very little um, learning occurs. And then there's stretch zone where there's a moderate level of anxiety. Learning's actually elevated a little bit and has a moderate, they end up start having like moderate sympathetic responses that Dr. Voss was talking about. Um, But at this point, it actually helps learning and it helps um, improve their performance and their cognitive level. But then when it gets so overwhelming, it kind of gets to the panic zone where it's severely impaired. They're just cognitively overloaded. Um, You know, their heart rate's going, their um, blood pressure's up, they're sweating, they just can't even think. And, you know, they really just get overwhelmed and almost shut down and it's debilitating. Um, you know, where the, those rescues and trying to help them is important. And we do see that sometimes in simulation. And I think, you know, kind of to segue off of what, what Nicole is thinking too, um, Annette, you had shared an interesting article that talked about um, the, the, unrealistic expectation of let's, let's get rid of anxiety. Uh, Let's, let's have zero anxiety. Can you share a little bit of your thoughts about what, what is actually realistic and, and what we should be doing there as faculty? Like what do we have control over maybe in a state or a situational anxiety versus a trait anxiety? You know, that's a a great topic, um, a great question. And looking at, you know, the, the state and the trait anxiety and our expectations, if that's the right word, realistic, because it seems in um, today's world where we're at right now, we do have 
um, some language that has is seen as negative. And so when you see say the word anxiety, it's it's sought as a um, negative word or a bad word. So we need to fix it. We need to, you know, fix that right away. We need to stop that anxiety from happening because it's a a problem. And really when um, some of the research that was done in this article um, by Janet Reed, um, and she has a lot of great resources cited within this article, but she did a small um, research group where she did a quantitative study using one group and repeated the measures um, in this research design um, to examine that relationship between state and trait, and and then looked at how is clinical judgment impacted. You know what she found is that in all of her lit research and um, the research that she did, is that the findings imply a changed focus to reframe. We need to reframe anxiety and how we think about how it affects our students understanding that not all anxiety is debilitating, but some it, um, facilitates challenges. And that we, what we need to look at is the realistic or the realism of life that anxiety is expected. And especially when we're talking about healthcare, there is no way to not get around it in our nursing profession um, that anxiety is real. So um, how can we best then look at that anxiety and help our students to recognize what level of anxiety they're at and how it's impacting their functioning. So um, further discussion went on, you know, about some interventions that we might be able to implement, um, yet they still need some further research in that area. But some of the best results have come from some of that mindfulness, the mindfulness approach, which with one student in particular that I worked with, this semester, she came to my office concerned about how her anxiety over each semester has increased. And um, I had her do some metacognition, you know, just some of that personal reflection. Because um, the only person that can recognize where they're truly at and where it's coming from is them, right? And so she did some reflection and we talked about really where her anxiety was coming from was that embarrassment of making a mistake. She didn't want to be embarrassed. And so then, you know, going back and talking about, you know, in simulation, we talk about why we do SIM. So we had a discussion about the purpose behind SIM and um, that psychological environment. We talked about safety in that environment and her particular group of students that she's working with. Our facility, we use, we keep the clinical group together for their simulated experiences or for a vast majority of them. And then of course she had her own personal things in her background, she had, you know, some medical things, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not that I was in the place of being a healthcare worker or a mental health person, but it was just helping her do some processing about where that anxiety was totally coming from, and then um, giving her some direction about resources, further resources that could be available to her to help her. But she did say, you know, just being able to identify that embarrassment piece was really helpful to her. And so, you know, I think that that targeted um, those pieces in here. And is she, when you look at that state versus trait, she worries about everything. Control is a, a, is an issue, so that correlates when you have that high um, trait sc- score. It goes to the state usually coming high. So she was a really validation to um, this study, which Janet found the same things. You know, with the students, they really followed suit with that, and really again the highlight being recognizing that what we need to do is as faculty is recognize, helping our students recognize this is normal, but what is, you know, I, I allude it to pain. So when you ask a person their level of pain, where's your level of anxiety and what can you function through, you know, and then we can look at other alternatives from there. Because again, it's going to be individual. 
Yeah. And I think that brings up a great point too. And it speaks back to Nicole's conversation about the curve. Like we're trying to find that sweet spot where there's enough of that um, arousal, if you will, with that anxiety to help our performance and to help us engage in a learning process. Um, Too little, it sounds like creates this lack of engagement and we're not learning anything. We're not really doing anything, but too much is crippling for the student and can really, you know, be, um, Um, an unsafe psychological environment within that simulation, you know, that simulation experience. So as simulation faculty, uh, you know, when we think about our healthcare simulation standards of best practice, and uh, there are a few different pieces that come out of each of those, um, those practice criterion that guide us as facilitators of simulation. So I'd like to guide our conversation to talk about uh, pre-brief, for example, when we talk about um, state and trait anxiety, uh, you know, trait anxiety is something that the student, you know, we can help them to work through it, but we may be as Uh, facilitators have a little bit more control over some state anxiety issues. So I'd like us to to talk about with a pre-brief and maybe prep work and things like that. What are some things that we can do within a pre-brief to help to um, maybe lessen anxiety just a little bit? Well, I think one of the places that we generally start in in pre-briefing and what the standards talk about is, you know, letting the students know that this is a psychologically a safe place for them to learn meaning that, you know, what happens in SIM, what they see there, what they hear there stays there. Um, And that, you know, we are all learning. So mistakes are expected. We're not expecting perfection. That the goal of this is to help you learn and to find out where your learning gaps are related to our objectives that we're going to achieve today. So, you know, if a mistake is made, we'll come back and we'll talk about it in debrief and talk about how we can improve and change that without being concerned that my classmates are going to talk to somebody else outside of this about what I did, because the goal is learning and patient safety. So um, part of that standard of creating that psychologically safe place is introducing the students to the objectives to, um, you know, the realism contract that we're looking at, to looking at how do, how are we, um, what is the ultimate purpose of simulation? And then also allowing them to ask questions. You know, their prep, I think we're all aware, get, has a little bias in it, so, so to speak, for the sim, because based on their prep, they get an idea of what that sim's going to be about. But there's obviously, there's, probably for some of them, and it's been my experience, they have fears about that. And so inquiring about what has been your experience or what are your concerns about taking care of a patient with um, respiratory distress, for example, and being able to have a little bit of that discussion before we go in there. Um, And then also making sure that I am orientating them to that room and that environment very carefully Because, for example, um, we don't allow the fluids to run into our mannequins, right, even though they could. So our SimTech has put a pan underneath the mannequin with an IV bag in it, and that's where um, the fluid goes to. And uh, I've learned from past experience that it's important that you have to point that pan out because the students will get stuck on that like it's supposed to be part of the, the Sim, and we lose focus, you know, and... Um, it makes it hard for them to meet the objectives and they get distracted by that. So I, you know, and there's articles about that, that we have to do a really good job of orientating them, not um, only in talking to them about that environment before we get into it, but looking at that environment and all the resources that they have available to them. I, I like that you bring up the the idea of orienting them to the simulation space, and and I've seen a similar um, sort of a similar um, concern from students as they cor- they get fixated on that drain bag essentially, and they want to treat it like IV, you know, an IV bag. I, this should be hung up on the pole. Is this an, is this on purpose? And um, I think also it's it speaks to the idea of uh, not necessarily in internal rescue in simulation if students are sort of veering away from learning outcomes, but but our standards do talk about giving um, 
uh, you know, scripted cues or maybe unscripted cues to students to help to get them back on track and that it would be appropriate as long as it's done in sort of a systematic standardized way. Like we're, um, you know, we're using the SP or standardized patient to give cues like, oh, hey, what about my knee pain? Or, you know, make it kind of getting them to, to bring the focus back or maybe a phone call from the provider to, you know, to ask a specific question to help them to get back on track. I think there's a lot of conversation to be had around that to help to make the students learn in that safe environment. And I think to your point, Allison, that is really a great point about how we can bring out those cues to help them get back on track. And you, um, I believe, talked about the level of the learner also. So for example, if a student calls me using SBAR and they don't have quite all the information or calls the provider with SBAR, isn't fitting all those categories or maybe doesn't have a recommendation or misses um, relevant assessment information in that phone call, I can cue in probably more of a therapeutic approach for a semester one or semester two student but maybe we're getting to a semester four or five, maybe I say, well, when you have all the information, call me back. Maybe not in such a stern tone, but yet at the same time, they need to recognize that we can recognize that at this level, they have the ability to gather the assessment information, but they're missing it. Um, And there is a time where if a little anxiety is developed in that situation, it's okay because that's real. I don't have to go to the level some of our providers may have done in the past to us, but yet at the same time, get them thinking, oh, I missed that, right? So it's in the tone, it's in the delivery, in how we present that, and then keeping in mind the the, the level of our learner. Right. Absolutely. And we've had conversations before talking about the balance between a safe learning environment and then also real world. So yes, you know, we, we want to try to lead them to the right answer to help them to learn and uncover what it is that they need to be doing. Um, But, you know, in, in a way that is supportive of learning, but recognizing, you know, what happens if you call the provider and you don't have all the information, what, what might happen, you know, so talking through some of those things. Um, so, and I, I want to bring in our conversation too about um, heart math and talking about, we, we've already identified eliminating anxiety is not realistic. It's just, it's not just something that we're, we're able to do. So Dr. Voss, how do we help students to manage anxiety as they are able? Can you tell us what, what heart math is all about? Absolutely. So um, heart math skills are simple, practical techniques. And these techniques can help a student to de-stress in the face of daily stressful situations, um, whether these are really big or they're small. Um, You know, students can actually change the way the body responds in stressful situations, such as maybe taking exams in, in simulation and in clinical and more. And again, these techniques are evidence-based. Um, peer-reviewed published research articles on these techniques, and they help to build up what is resilience, meaning that these techniques give you the ability to maintain composure and clarity, keeping you alert and calm. And even in really challenging situations, like, and we have been talking about simulations, certainly um, these techniques could help there. One of the basic techniques is actually called heart-focused breathing. And it, it, like I said, it's a basic technique and it it takes this charge out of a, a stress reaction and it helps you to shift to being more resilient um, it's it's just a simple technique, and it turns down the volume of that stress. So the technique actually focuses on the heart area, and you breathe deeper. And this technique and all the all the heart mass skill techniques are on the go techniques, meaning you don't have to stop what you're doing. Um, you don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to have the room quiet, anything like that. They can be done as you're engaging in activities. 
such as simulation or during an exam or in, in a clinical situation or when, when, when you're with patients. And, um, you know, Annette just talked about when you're, when you're talking with a healthcare provider, you can be doing these techniques at the same time. So um, if you'd like, I could bring you kind of through a, a, just a scenario and help you to do this right now if we have time for that. We absolutely do. I think that would be amazing. Yes, that sounds like okay, a great idea. Great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. And in fact, you know, simulations could start off like this if, if students would want to participate, the instructors could lead them in this activity. And um, th there actually is some research about the effects of a whole group doing this, that the, that the state of resilience even increases more. So let's focus our attention in the area of the heart. And many times I will place my hand over my heart to make sure I'm focusing on my heart. So what you're going to do is imagine your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. So focus that attention in the area of your heart and bring in breath through your heart area. Inhale for five seconds. And exhale. Inhale, and exhale. Focus on your heart area, inhale, and exhale. When I'm teaching this technique, I usually get asked, how, how long should you do this? Well, you know, you can continue to use this heart-focused breathing technique for about a minute, you know, um, and then it would be really important, now you've learned this technique, to go ahead and practice it three times a day, whether you need it or not. Then when you need it, when you're not feeling calm and composed, you lack clarity, um, you're, you're having trouble concentrating or thinking, that's a time to do this technique. Or if you know you're going to go into a stressful situation, do this technique before. You can start doing this technique during a stressful situation. And then definitely after, because you can think of resilience like energy. Resilience is energy, a state of energy, and it's like water in a bucket. And um, when you engage in, you know, moderate to severe anxiety, it, it shoots holes in your bucket and you lose that energy or that resilience. And so these techniques help you to plug that up a little bit so that you can think better. You, you maintain clarity and with calmness comes clarity. It helps your brain to work better. You improve mental and physical performance. You also increase short-term memory too. Thank you for that, Dr. Voss. I appreciate you offering the information about, you know, how often should I practice this? How long should I practice this? And, you know, if you practice it for a minute, three times a day, that's really nothing in, in the number of minutes that we have each day. And that, that maybe sounds very trite or very cliche, but I think too, when it kind of goes back to what Annette was saying, when we look at some of the techniques that people can, you know, do an internet search on to help to manage anxiety and it's, oh, you know, it's this 20 minute meditation or it's, it's exercising. It's going for a walk in nature for two miles. I don't know how long it takes you all to walk two miles, but you know, my, myself, it's going to take a little bit longer. And sometimes there's just not time in the day. So I think that, you know, giving people something that is functional and is based in evidence could really, really be helpful. Thank you. You know, I've seen students actually, uh, and I know that they're mastering these techniques and I've never in 11 years had a student who was not able to master these techniques in a very short period of time. Sometimes the day I teach them, that's how simple these are. And I can measure that with heart rate variability. I have the software on a computer that I measure pulse. And, and so I know that students are mastering these in a very short period of time. The more you practice them, the better you get at the techniques and that feeling of calm and alertness comes much faster the more you practice these techniques. In addition, I've seen students increase um, test scores 
with this. And then also, um, you know, if they're feeling the anxiety at clinical experiences or simulation, um, they have reported back to me that these techniques have helped them to decrease their feelings of anxiety and dread and that their performance has actually increased. So yeah, then students are seeing the benefit of that really in real time as well. That's great. That's great. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Voss, um, just to give you a little insight, yesterday I was in simulation and I actually had some students mention heart math. And then um, in clinicals before, I remember a student particularly kind of talking to themselves and saying, heart breathing, heart breathing. And I could tell that they were trying to, you know, focus their energies and try to, you know, um, refocus and things. But um, it's, you know, now it just kind of sticks out to me. It's like, oh, that's what they're doing. And when they said heart math, I knew, but the heart breathing was like, oh, that's what it was. So, you know, those are all great um, techniques to help and something that we could perhaps do either before a test or before simulation, just especially those high, really high anxiety um, simulations that are a little bit higher levels or students tend to get a little bit more um, anxious. But again, allowing that safe space and the ability to verbalize what we're feeling is important too. Nicole, I think you just brought up a really important, that safe space where they can talk about their feelings. And that is something that we've also incorporated within our simulations at South Dakota State is a feeling wheel and um, bringing that discussion in. Because oftentimes students, anybody, a lot of times you ask them how they're feeling about something good or bad. Well, let's talk about good and bad. You know, when they start looking at that feeling wheel and saying, well, um, um, I feel confident. Well, let's talk about that confidence. Where does that confidence come from? Or I feel defeated. Let's talk about defeated and, and what that means. And identifying those feelings and where they come from is another way of helping them to start managing their anxiety. I really love what Dr. Voss um, brought up and shared with us about the heart breathing because it's a great, easy technique to work with our students on um, to help them just uh, relax. I have frequently told students before we start an exam, I tell them I want everybody to take five deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. And we all do it because it naturally brings down heart rate. And I tell them during the course of the exam, um, if you start feeling your heart rate go up and you can't think anymore and you're getting frustrated and your mind is going, just stop. Take, you know, those few seconds to take those five deep breaths. So this really, you know, goes along with that. And I like the idea of bringing it into pre-brief. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, that's a great example, Annette. I've even seen students in the middle of the exam, you can just see their stress. And I'll just kind of, you know, walk by and just, okay breathe, not say anything, but just kind of take a couple deep breaths, see them doing it, myself doing it. And they're like, okay, you can just kind of see them. Okay. I need to <laughs> try to calm down. So anything that we can do to help our students is so important. All right. Well, I think we've talked about a lot of great things today, talking about, you know, anxiety and how to help students to understand that it's not a bad thing. It's not necessarily something that needs to be, um, you know, frowned upon as in, um, there are different ways to manage it, simple, easy ways that we can use right in the moment to help them to manage it, not only in nursing school, but as they kind of move forward into their profession and they are coming across these, these uh, stressful situations within their career. So I just want to thank our guests, um, lecturer Annette Ray and Dr. Joe Voss for joining us. And of course, my fellow instructor, Nicole Albert. I appreciate everyone's time today. And this is us signing off.